So welcome everyone this morning. Welcome Caroline. Today we're going to do a question and answer section with um, our guest today. Um, Caroline is the artistic director of Glass Half Full Theater. She is, um, oh gosh, what's your title for Austin Puppet Incident? One of the co-creators, co-everything? Uh, curator, yeah. Curator. <laughs> co-curator. Um, for Austin Puppet Incident, um, she's created work that's toured the U.S. Um, with all sorts of local theater companies. Um, and so she's here today to tell us a little bit about her process and then hear your questions and, and answer them. Thanks for having me. I just want to double check y'all are design and uh, collaborative design. Is that the focus? Yeah, okay. So this class is intro to collaborative design, but we have performers, we have directors, um, we have costume <laughs> folks. Um, scenic folks, lighting folks, a little bit of everything. Great. I love that. I, I work in a super collaborative field just by nature. Um, so yeah, I, I do run a theater company um, and then my job in that is an art, a producing artistic director. So that means I, um, oh, you know, I'm such a fan of like non hierarchical structures, <laughs> but technically at the end of the day, my butt is on the line financially and artistically for everything we produce. That mm -hmm. said, um, I really, really love to collaborate. The work that we make um, is, we, uh, I work with like many different um, artists. We have artists in the company who are, um, also like producing artists for us so they might um, be the one to come up with the main idea for a show and start to push it through and then I assist to that or other times it's my idea for the show and then I bring people in we do work with a lot of outside people the the line is permeable but <laughs> people that we bring in for a show a lot of the times we kind of collect people as we go and add collaborators um, throughout the gosh, 15, 18 years I've been running the company. Um, I am by, like my art is I'm a movement person. By that I mean I trained in physical theater. So my approach to creating work is collaborative and it, uh, very much in the space. So rather than a, a more traditional approach where a playwright writes a play, workshops a play, kind of gets the whole play together and then that play is plucked by a producer and then a director is chosen and then actors are chosen in a very kind of linear process. My work is a little bit more from the direction of let's start with an idea. Who do we want? Who is our audience? What are we trying to say? What is the premise of this story? What issues or ideas are we trying to work with and put all that in a big bucket and then start kind of carving away so often that means working with movement or materials, even before we're worried about what are we, what are we going to say out loud in the room. So a scripting process looks um, a little bit different. I mean, it's all relative. I think the forms are merging. I don't want to act like there's two ways to do to make theater. But um, I'm definitely, even when I'm credited as, as the playwright, it's often you know, it'll say meet Caroline Reck with and name other people, or it'll be, you know, just two straight up authors. I have a show with Caroline and Rupert Reyes with, that we wrote really together, or Caroline Reck and um, Indigo Real that we really wrote together, both of us sitting down typing, right? Um, but there are often more people in the room that are necessarily acknowledged on that byline, and we try to make sure to, to reference them as well, wherever we credit the work. Um, because maybe they improvised a bit of it or they uh, created a character and brought it into the story that wasn't our creation that we added to or amplified with them. Um, and then I should mention my other big area of expertise is in puppetry. Um, I came into puppetry from movement theater. I studied a movement form when I was already a working adult actress, I went to France at 25 and for two years studied at the Lecoq School, which is a movement-based theater program for professionals um, who are already into their careers who want to focus on this area. 
um, and did that for two years and actually stayed in France and ended up building puppets and creating a lot of puppet work over there because there's a little bit more fluid of a line between traditional theater and puppetry there. When I came back to the United States, um, when I was about 29, then I um, really in earnest started working and building my own work. Um, again, always in collaboration with a bunch of other folks. So, and my last thing I will say is when I talk about collaborative theater, often looking at who is your audience, um, what, uh, what topics are you looking at and what forms are you using? I guess those are the three things I always have to think about. I've talked now a little bit about that third thing, what form, and it tends to be devised physical theater or puppetry. Um, the, in terms of topic, I'm really interested in social justice. And by that, I mean human justice, justice for all world citizens, especially environmental justice, because I think that's the root of all of it. So a lot of our shows deal with ecology and how change, shifts in global atmosphere have forced people to relocate and the way those things are all tied together. So a lot of our work focuses on environmental justice as the premise for a story, not necessarily just political theater, but that's the premise for the story. And then in terms of our, um, who our audience is, that is an ever shifting field for us. I would say we're not a traditional theater company that says we're here to make shows for six to 10 year olds, or we make shows about this particular social group or anything like that. We really do kind of collectively look at the topics we're interested in and then pursue those. For that reason, um, when I'm marketing shows, it's a little tricky because we're not just always reaching out to the same group every time. Um, we, I've sort of started using the word, the term multi-generational theater to say that I'm really interested in making theater that can apply, apply to a really broad age range of people. So that doesn't mean we don't sometimes make shows that are more for kids, especially in the world of puppetry. That's something that's sought after a lot and there's financial opportunities for us to work um, for to create youth theater. But I would say our youth theater shows tend to be quite sophisticated and not, um, they stick out on the American market, I would say, for not being necessarily like musical theater jazz hands. There's a lot of that in the market. We are a much more sort of sophisticated. We expect a lot from the youth audience to sort of lean into it and understand uh, the themes we're talking about. Like we let them kind of we send them up into it rather than kind of catering to the easy side of it. And then the work we do for adults is often seen as really imaginative and coming from a sort of childlike perspective, except we do really see it as for adults because at times the themes are really sexy. There's a lot of, um, you know, gender and sexual identity stuff that works into that. Um, you know, those shows often involve cursing to make points because sometimes that's what the character needs to do. So we do have sort of a section that we think of as more our adult work and our straight up youth work, but there's a lot of crossover as well. So that said, um, having worked for, you know, 15 plus years for this company, as well as collaborating with many other companies and doing work as an artist and puppeteer for other people and designer, um, I've worked with for a lot of different age groups in a lot of different um, uh, situations and to achieve different social goals through the, through the creation of theater. So that's my kind of who I am and the perspective I'm coming from. Um, if you're interested in the visual representation of what I mean by that, the company Glass Half Full Theater, we have a website, which like everybody else, I'm sure during the <laughs> downtime, we're completely changing. So what you'll look at is a little out of date, but we do have um, our shows listed on there and you can kind of click through and get a sense. There's some video to show you the sort of work that we do. Um, we also have a lot of work on um, Vimeo is actually the main place we store our video because it's just an easier library than YouTube's been. But we do have some of our newer stuff on YouTube as well, always under Glass Half Full Theater, um, theater with an RE. You can look at our Instagram and, and Facebook. There's also some good visual stuff there to get a sense of the kind of work we do. And um, finally, I will say as part of our social justice approach and also just the makeup of our artistic company, we do a lot of work um, around themes of Latinidad and uh, bilingual work, Latinx. There's issues with the term, so I'm gonna say Latinidad. 
but um, a lot of our artists are of Latino descent and we do a lot of work around uh, focusing where those issues are, are brought to the forefront um, within the show. So that's my kind of background spiel on who I am in terms of being able to ask questions. Is there something you'd like me to talk about specifically from one of those shows you're familiar with, um, Rachel, or do we want to just jump into questions? What's the best format for you? I would love to jump into questions. First off, thank you sure. so much for that, um, for that overview. That was fantastic. Um, a lot of that framing is really super helpful to think about in terms of um, devising and collaborating to make stuff. Um, let's jump into questions now. Great. Um, so does, can you raise your hands? Um, who would like to start with a question? I will say I am, especially on Zoom, I find it really hard <laughs> to suddenly be the first person to speak of. I was actually thinking about this um, this morning. Ironically, so I'm just, so give you all a second. Oh wait, somebody, somebody's going for it. Okay, I'll tell you my story later. Jer, uh, Jared, <laughs> am I saying that right? Yeah, you're saying it right. So I have a question in regards to creativity. I've noticed like, as I've gotten older, I'm 31 now that my creativity isn't where it was when I was younger. What do you do to, to kind of hold on to that creativity as you get older? I love that question. And we, a lot of our work focuses on imagination. And I think it's why we're often sort of tagged as like childlike wonder, even you're an adult in your adult work, <laughs> because we do, um, because it's really important to me. And I think it's something we've lost. And I also think it's something theater is particularly good at because you're in a room together and you're kind of reminded of, well, we used to be in a room together, uh, reminded of like our, what humanity has in common, like what we all have in common, what's universal for us. So I will say, I agree with you. Um, I know at the greater my responsibilities, the harder it is to like have vacant time to, to think, right? To, I know when I was, for example, when I was 25 and um, at the school in France, my job, my, you know, I would get up every day and go to the school for five hours in the morning. And then I would go and nanny in the afternoon to be able to afford to live there, you know, illegally basically, and then go home. And I didn't, I had very little money, so I couldn't go out much. And I basically could just walk around and think like I couldn't afford book. This was pre internet. I mean, the internet, you had to go to an internet cafe and pay like a certain amount of money per hour. So we, I didn't really use the internet much. Um, I didn't read French very well. So I couldn't really even like get books. So I was pretty limited to just sitting around and thinking. And that I do think carving out time for yourself every day, even if it's 10 to 15 minutes, where you're not allowed to think strategically for a minute. I spend a lot of my time thinking strategically. I have a five-year-old daughter. I'm homeschooling her in the midst of all of this. I'm running a company. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what grants can we grab to stay afloat? It's very hard to not think strategically all the time, but um, that's, it's not a, the best way to be imaginative, right? I will also say um, when, you're, when you're doing this time to not think about something, try to shift your perspective. So don't necessarily sit where you eat or lie down on your bed, but like go lie down outside and look at clouds and see what the clouds are doing. Or one trick for me is I'll go and find a tree and sit under a tree and look at the leaves and what they're doing. Or I'll find like a patch of shadow on the wall and look at what it's doing. I like to, to get cues from nature as small as the patches of nature we have access to might be. Um, and, and then find a new way to look at it, whether it's lying down or like just if you have five minutes, just lie on your floor and look and be like, what have I not noticed from this perspective? Like, oh, I should dust under my bed or whatever. Let that go. Oh, my sock I was missing. It's like, take it in and then let it go, you know? Um, and just because the room I'm in, I'm thinking of something. Um, I had these patches you know, where our roof had leaked and we couldn't afford to fix it. And eventually we fixed the roof, but I never fixed the ceiling. And they were up, there was sort of dark patches on my ceiling for a long time that every time I looked at them would irritate me because it's like, oh, one more thing for my list that I should do. I got to paint that and 
prime it and all that stuff. And then my daughter, who was three at the time, was looking at them and she was like, oh, mommy, I love your ceiling so much. And I said, what? What do you mean? What do you see? And she said, well, there's a fish up there, but there's a bear that's chasing it. But the fish family is going to save the fish from the bear. And she had like seen all these little things in this like gross thing that was annoying me. And like, I feel like that taking inspiration from remembering how to think like that of like, how do you see something in a new way? One other thing is we do a lot of what's called object theater or object puppetry, where you take an everyday object and manipulate it as if it's a little character. Um, sometimes that means combining objects. Sometimes you just take an object. And if you look around your house or especially like garage types items, you'll find stuff that just really looks like a little creature. And we sort of give them purpose and character. And when you start to like allow yourself to see humanity in natural or man-made objects, I think it, it also gets, for me, it gets my imagination going in that kind of childlike way. So those are my, those are my tricks. It's a great question. Awesome. Thank you so much. That definitely helps a ton. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, Jaren. Thanks for being the first person. I appreciate yeah. that. Oh. Jeremy, I saw your hand raised. Let's, let's go to your question next. Uh, hi, Caroline. Hi. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you, and it's great to hear your story. I've been kind of reading up on you since we've, you know, gotten this assignment. Um, so I guess, you know, I'll, you've been running a theater company for as long as, um, for as long as you have. I guess the question is, how how long does your average creative process uh, take, or do you give yourself, you know, time to, actually, you know, have a concept and have a complete concept before you perform? I love that question. And it, it's, it's been changing over the years. And I find a lot of the times the sort of fiscal requirements often end up dictating that. And as much as possible, we push back against that. By that, I mean, um, when I was first making work and doing it all for, you know, pennies, I could take as long as I wanted. And that, that can actually be a really good thing. And some of my most artistic, the work I'm most proud of, I gave myself all the time I wanted until it felt done. Um, and then that has maybe shifted over the years as we have maybe yearly requirements. One of our sources of funding is the city and they want you to you know, have a thing to show at the end within a year of the time you get the money and you have to prove how you use the money and all of that. And I'm very grateful for that. While Austin's funding has struggled a little bit, I, I've lived in a lot of other cities that were not as um, generous or straightforward in how to, how to uh, access that funding. So I do appreciate that here. So I would say, for example, I have a piece on, that you could find on the Vimeo and the web, website called the Orchid Flotilla which um, is a, initially was a solo piece, although there is one other actor who ended up taking a, a really important part in it sort of halfway through the process. But it's a show that I created over probably 18 months. And the only way I could do it was every Sunday, I went to a rehearsal space, it wasn't even really an official rehearsal space, but it was something that wasn't being used all day on Sunday and nobody ever wanted to use it on Sunday. So, I had a kind of an extensive set piece in this show. If you look at the video, you'll see it. the story is about a woman living alone on a, um, an island of trash in the, in the middle of the ocean in the future. And it's sort of trash from our time period, plastic junk. She doesn't know what it is and she reuses it to survive in her own way. And um, that show, so I had to make a whole structure. It was like wooden pieces and styrofoam and everything that I would put together because she lives inside of this structure the whole time. And I worked on it every Sunday for 12 hours, like from eight to eight, that was it. I would go on Sundays and set it up and it took me an hour to set it up and then I would work on it and then I would take an hour and take it down and then put it in my closet and just think and process on it all week. And then I would go back in the room and it was um, incredibly frustrating. There were times where it was like, you know, you have to set it for yourself. You have to find the time. And that show needed a long span of time all by itself. And then I had to walk away from it. Other things, the show I'm working on right now is called The Kukui Project, which um, Rachel is the lighting designer for. It's been delayed a lot for COVID and actually other reasons prior to that. Um, we've been collaborating a lot as a group and doing weekend um, 
you know, once a month weekend Zoom sessions to sort of go over the work we had created when we were able to be together. And now I'm taking it as my job to write the script. I mean, sit alone and type the script, which is what it kind of eventually often comes down to. And I'm giving myself an hour and a half every morning that I do that. Um, and that that's maybe not my ideal way, but it's the way that works for me right now. So that show has, because of all of the delays and um, structural rethinkings of how to approach it, it's actually been in process for two years. So that's another long one. But I will say, to function as a theater company, we have to make the shows where you go, I got the idea, I'm gonna build it, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna set it up, it's gonna take a month and a half and we're gonna have it ready to go and we've already set where we're performing it and we're gonna take it down after that. And those show, you know, some of those, I allow for some of the shows to be that simple and just be, off, especially if it's our kid work, we just kind of figure it out, make it, put it up, set it down and then set it aside and keep it in the library. So that I find frequently, I'm working on about three or four shows at a time, which is not everybody's game, that not everybody has that kind of split attention and I am struggling with it increasingly. But I'm usually at least planning something for 18 months out, selling something that is already complete, but I'm trying to perform in more venues or spaces, and then working on the thing that's immediately coming up next. So there's sort of this sort of previous stuff that exists that I'm selling, the stuff I'm working on for an immediate result, and then the like long burn, long back burner stuff that's sort of growing into something for the future, um, which is, it's, hard, but I haven't found another way to do it and still keep the money coming in, if that makes sense. Um, that said, this is definitely from the perspective, again, of somebody that we entirely create our work. So I think an artistic director who buys plays and puts up five shows a year would have a very different answer to that question. But um, coming from somebody fully making work, it can be anywhere from three months to 18 months plus. And then shows will stay in rotation and come back out and then we burst it for three days and put it up. So it, it, uh, we, we have a little storage unit where we keep it all <laughs> and, and then just track it all, uh, the scripts and everything, track it on the computer and a lot of videoing and making sure we're able to, to pull stuff back up. It's a really good question too. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Ryan? Yes. Um, so I had a question. Um, I heard that you were talking about how you uh, were a nanny and you have a five-year-old. Did you ever put on puppet shows like while you were nannying and do you do it for your kid and stuff? That's funny. Um, so when I was, uh, yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, when I was nannying, it was right when I was discovering that a lot of the work I'd been doing was kind of puppetry because I didn't come into puppetry in the kind of obvious um, Muppet show style puppetry. Although I do that now because it's frankly the highest paying form of puppetry. So it's a good commercial gig to have, um, to be able to get handed a puppet and perform it um, for kids shows and stuff like that. But um, at the time I hadn't really been puppeteering but I did have this one puppet from childhood who's literally right here. Um, it's just a, a purchased puppet, right? That somebody gave me when I was eight or something. <laughs> was in France with me. My daughter's coming in to see. She is on a Zoom session. Can you believe that, Clementine? Do you want to say hi really quick? Hi. These are students. They are design and um, theater creation students of Rachel, who you've met before because she did the lighting design for lots of shows. But I have to keep talking to them. Can I talk to you soon? Thank you. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Okay, um, so, sorry, real life. Oh, <laughs> so yes, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely did like kind of use this puppet that I just had with me, who's my good old friend. Um, but uh, it didn't really occur to me. I was actually on a plane once and had that guy with me in my backpack and some kids were getting rowdy and acting up. So I got him out to like calm them down and their mom's like, thank you, are you a professional puppeteer? And I was like, you can be a professional puppeteer. Like this random person was the first person and it made me realize, oh, I should put that in my, the back of my head. 
uh, at some point during all that time period. But, and then in terms of puppetry now, yes. So we brought, she's been on tour with us a few times from three months old. Um, and then another good chunk when she was two, two and a half to three. Um, and so she, as far as she's concerned, she's been in the place. It's not true. She just, you know, we bring out a curtain call sometimes with a puppet or something like that. But she definitely lives in the, in the world of puppetry a lot. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking. Of course. Good timing on the kid, right? I was like, well, let me press the buzzer under my desk. <laughs> I was a nanny and worked with kids. So I totally, I was like, there's my question I can ask. <laughs> yeah, no. And I will say, um, there's a really interesting thing about puppetry for kids. I'm sure there's a term for this, that the Valley of something. Yeah, I can't think there's a term for this, but like what, what we believe and what we don't believe. And um, for puppetry, children about the age of three to five, six, totally believe in puppets. Like they believe in them as real. That's kind of the range. And then adults don't believe they're real. Obviously a seven-year-old, they know, but there's a great deal of joy in believing, like, pretending to believe like we get we get um when i do a lot of work obviously with puppets with adults and one of the best things they do is die because if you've seen a puppet moving that then dies and is still when a human actor dies and lies still we're all like oh look horatio is still breathing hard from the sword fight and you know we don't we we agree to believe the actor is being dead but we know we know they're not dead when a puppet dies they are flat and dead and when their their puppeteer releases them and leaves them lying there they're really dead so there's a great deal of joy that even an adult audience who knows they're not real experiences in, in seeing that transition for a puppet. And then kids under the age of three, like zero, one, two, especially babies. If you try to show them a puppet, their eyes look at the puppet for like one second and then they just look at the, you, the puppeteer, and they're just like, nah, you know? Um, <laughs> because they don't, they don't believe it. <laughs> But they're all still, they still want to communicate, but they sort of put you in a triangle with the puppet. So it's, it's quite interesting to me that it's seen as like a kid's art because there's actually a very narrow of age range where they believe them. And that's pretty much the Sesame Street crowd, right? That like preschool, learn your alphabet, everything. They really believe it. Like my daughter's like, Elmo is my friend. I, you know, I want to talk to him about his grammar. I don't know why he says me, everything, but you know, whatever. Like she's, you know, it's funny. Oh, I love she that. Has, like, <laughs> If, and I actually know the puppeteer who performs Abby Cadabby, so we had her send a little message to Clementine for her four, fourth or fifth birthday, I can't remember, being like, hi, Clementine, it's Abby, and it was really cute. Uh, oh, so I she thinks, that. I know Abby, my mom and dad know Abby, it's, you know. Um, yeah, but that, I was going to say that about puppets, there's like a, a specific range, and they're li younger kids don't believe it, but they're intrigued by why you're doing it. They're, but they're looking at the puppeteer usually like, why? What's going on? Or they'll go up and want to pull it, the puppet out and look at your hand or whatever. You know. Oh my god, that is so awesome. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Of course. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. We have a question from Amelia in the chat. Um, Oh, great. So she uh, says, you said that single use objects distress you deeply. What do you think about time? People act as if it can be reused, but it can't. You can't save it either, but you can take advantage of it. I was wondering what your thoughts were on time. Oh, I love this question. Okay, so this, as somebody who works in environmental theater a lot, this is, this is something that comes up a lot. I was at a conference in Miami last summer for, um, uh, I forget what we called it, but basically it was a collection of theater artists working on shows and issues about climate change. And I was delighted that there were 15 of us <laughs> that all wanted to get together. I, I was shocked when somebody reached out and said, you should be at this. Um, the, so what, what we notice, theater artists are pressed for time. Duh, right? We know that. It's, it's, um, it is not a highly funded field. You need to get things created as quickly as possible. They take a lot of time to do well. So whenever you can cut corners, you want to, right? And increasingly, that's meant 
for a lot of people buying props and sets or you know items costumes things you need go on amazon get it you don't even have to go look for it you can send it back if it's the wrong thing i mean compared to digging through used through the 18 goodwills in town to find the run that has the chair that you want it's it's very it's an easy choice to make right and it saves us time us time <laughs> but the hand the the time is taken away somewhere else from somebody else on the globe when we participate in easy fast use i uh consumer structures like that that said committing to saying okay even though uh a certain number of years ago a prop artist would need 27 hours to drive around looking for things before they could even start work now they can have the materials at their house in two days for uh, in 30 minutes or uh, with 30 minutes of time so how do you compensate the person's time differently to make it worth it to them to not purchase those things on inter on amazon and get them in 30 minutes because how does theater have enough time for a prop to pay a props artist fairly for all of that time they would use and um, it's something that comes up a lot, logging. Um, there's an idea of sharing your, but in the environmentally conscious artist community, of sharing your budgets publicly on your website, saying this is how much everybody's paid. This is the, uh, especially in like kind of decolonization and, um, uh, you know, hierarchical flattening <laughs> type uh, communities saying this is what the artistic director makes because this is how much time they're spending or this is how much the props person makes because this is how much time they're spending and where you save money you lose time um and obviously that single uh, the question is about single use objects um distressing me which is something i've written and talked about um the for me that single use item might save the person time Using it, you don't have to wash the dish or you don't have to remember to bring your to-go cup or, um, you know, when you're, I think single use items become an even bigger problem, you know, at parties and festivals and theater events where you need to sell somebody a cup of wine, but then you have to think about what, okay, I can buy plastic cups for two bucks, but what if we brought in a bunch of old cups from the Goodwill and then somebody has to wash them and then you have to think about, do, are they properly sanitized? And there's so many other uh, there's so much time that's required to skip out on the cheaper option. So when you're doing, you know, time versus money charts, it's um, it's easy to to just go with the with the single use option. And when you're choosing not to do that, I think it's really important to figure out how to compensate for the time it will then require, and to make that obvious to your audience that you're spending that extra time, and that that's why it might cost more. Or maybe if you're putting your tickets up and you need to make a reduced price ticket to enable the broadest range of people to be able to go to make a note in your ticketing to say the true cost is higher it's this because of these things that we go out of our way to provide for such as not using single use or not using amazon if you're somebody who can afford to pay that difference you know offering that ticket price and says you know i kept the you know, I, I kept the group off Amazon or whatever, you know, like acknowledging the time that's being lost as a result of uh, the ecological practices you're doing. I know that was maybe my take on your question. Um, I, and I basically in general, in the broader sense, I agree with you, time cannot be brought back. But I think if you're going into theater, there's an acknowledgement that your time to get it right you're going to be spending probably more time than you feel like you're being compensated for to do the very best job and it's figuring out what are the areas you can be super efficient with your time in so that you can give all, the most time to the the most important artistic parts of it and often that's just organizing yourself very well i know as a producer i've taken this covid time to really improve our organizational structure so we don't waste time figuring out how to communicate or when to communicate or where to put information. I think the more time, the time you take to set that up helps save time later. Big, big answer to a very big question. I'm going to take one second just to close my door because a dog came in or out and I, it's bugging me. I'll be right back. Thank you, Caroline. One thing I think that's so great about that answer too is thinking about giving 
audiences the opportunity to opt in. Um, so uh, I was just saying what I love, one thing that I loved in that answer, which is full of all these great things, is giving the audience the, uh, the option to opt in. Um, you know, giving, treating them not only as consumers of your art and consumers of your product, but as co-collaborators in a way, as, as people who are ch making choices and choosing um, to join you on, on your um, ethical journey as well as your storytelling journey. So that's that's awesome. Yeah, I think that we, it's, yeah, it's acknowledging that, um, you know, everybody wants a good deal. So when you're looking and you're like, I could pay $5 or 40, why would I, there are people who go, why would I pay 40 when I can pay five? Like, I don't understand why on earth I would do that. I've had, mm -hmm. even at box office before we got really explicit about the reasons for the cost differences, they would just be like, or kind of a, well, what am I getting? Am I getting something better? And that's because we have a very transactional society. So we learned as sort of silly as it felt to say, <laughs> this is what we, uh, this is why this is like what you're subsidizing. Um, I, I think there, it just allows you to say, gosh, I can't support that right now. I, I don't have the money right now to support it. I lost my job in COVID and we get it and that's fine. And especially as we're doing stuff online, we're trying to make sure to acknowledge that of just honestly putting stuff up for free and then saying, here's why we hope you can pay for it. But we get that many, many people can't right now, like including me, <laughs> like when I'm going to see my friend's work, I can't always pay for it, but I can repost it. I can share how great the work was, like I can help in other ways sometimes. And it's just thinking about what, well, what can you do? What part of your time can you, can you contribute? Awesome, thank you. Um, who, does someone have another question? Yeah, Kirsta, do you wanna? Take us away. Yeah. Uh, hi, Carolyn. Um, so I used to work on a very big show with intricate puppets. Um, so I was wondering what the most intricate puppet you've ever used was what and you whether you me? prefer that. Um, so I used to work at Disney. So I used uh -huh. to work on Finding Nemo the Musical, which unfortunately yesterday um, got the axe. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, they laid off their entire cast, crew, and production. Uh, so if I was still there, I would have been laid off. Um, I was actually laid off from Disney as a photographer earlier this year, so different. Um, yeah, so I was wondering what the most intricate puppet that you've used is and whether you prefer those more like object-based or if you um, like more intricate puppets. By intricate, do you mean like mechanics and in mechanisms inside the puppet or? Yeah, so um, the Nemo puppets, they're a, a very wide range. Um, like the actual characters were often um, pole puppets with um, triggers. And, but then there was also like sea turtles that were backpack puppets or um, the giant sea turtle that had two people inside operating at a very large level. Um, so yes, I guess mechanics would probably be the most <laughs> accurate way to describe intricate. Yeah, no, I just wanted, I was curious what the, what your reference was for it. So that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, that sounds really fun. Um, I, I like them both for different reasons. I think I have like a goal of showing people how skillful puppetry can make even the simplest thing really, really compelling. I find that, that that is a really good equalizer and as here's the thing about object puppets because i get asked all the time to teach kids object puppets and it's funny because i'm like they can kind of do it and it's fun for them but actually it's adults who need it more and can do it better because you have to understand time and i think in a way that kids don't really so much of object theater is thinking about when do you bring something on stage what is its entrance how long does it stay there how can it transform what does it turn into if combined with another puppet and kids can't, they don't always have the patience for that. They're just kind of like, ah, right away, which it's really cool to watch a kindergartner be like, and then learn to be like, oh, I get it. The book could just fly. And like, this isn't flying, but this is fly. You know what I mean? Like, it's cool to watch them transform from like, ah, to, to slightly more um, intricate and careful. So I really like that as a message for equality that like anybody can pick up your tape dispenser and turn it into a you know, rhino, if you want, within the context of the other things that's performing with. But I do, I can really geek out on the, on the mechanics puppetry, especially 
once I started making them and applying them to my stuff. Um, I have a, a, a bird puppet in um, Petra and the Wolf, with, which Rachel also lit for us when we did it um, at the, uh, the, the State Theater and um, in downtown here. And um, the puppet, okay, so the, because casts are expensive, we had four animal characters. It's based on Peter and the Wolf, so it's still a wolf, a cat, a, bir a bird, and a um, duck. And they had to be performed by one person each. The person is visible, standing in black with a hood next to the puppet, because it was for a big stage, right? So the animals are animal size. The wolf is huge, you know, it comes up to the waist on the tall man who operated it. Um, the bird was kind of a turkey sized bird, a chachalaca, which is native to Texas. They're all kind of native Texas. It's also in Mexico, that bird. But we were given the, um, requirement essentially that there could only be one person per puppet um when that is a rod or overhead puppet and the puppeteers are hidden that's an easy thing to pull off but we knew we wanted to be able to use the stage floor to maneuver around because we also had a live human character interacting as well as a full-bodied puppet so it's like a a man who's essentially wearing the pants of the puppet it was the grandpa and then the grandpa is in front of him and he's operating the head with one hand and then one hand with the arm and there's like a fake arm i think it was just in his pocket or something um so they had to interact with them and be the appropriate size for them with the bird we needed to choose okay with the bird we wanted it to be able to pick things up in its beak we wanted it to be able to fly so flap two wings and we wanted it to be able to walk around where you see its little feet moving one person having to hold and operate all of those different parts, you have to kind of prioritize what's the most important, right? Because you've only got really one hand to stabilize and one hand to do things. Um, so what we did is we knew we wanted to prioritize the being able that it could pick things up with its beak. So we had a mechanism all the way from the head of the bird up, you know, two feet to where the puppeteer's hand was that if she pulled the plunger, essentially the bird, it was like a little claw, like one of those claws that would pick up a stuffed animal, uh, you know, in a box. Sorry, we won't get into that. It always makes me sad when I see this. But um, so it had to pick up sticks. So hidden inside the beak, just below the beak is this little claw. So it could lean over and it looked like it would pick it up and then set it down in the, in the uh, girl character's hand. And kids were always like, whoa, how is it doing that? And then simultaneously, she's gotta be able to walk it. So we made the feet um, bendable so they could kind of bounce along like this if you didn't want to be operating them independently but if you did when she was walking on the ground she could switch her hand placement and sort of with a lever walk the feet up and down so there are moments when the bird is just walking and she can really focus on the feet then she switches her focus to picking something up with the beak then she drops the feet because when the bird is flying it doesn't matter um, and then we left the wings to be totally just incidental movement it's kind of a turkey type bird, so they don't really fly. It's not like you need to build a really specific wing style. It really just needed to be like, wah, 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 and then get, you know, and fall. It, the idea was that it went away from the wolf, it couldn't get up to the tree. So you, it, you need to kind of see that it can't go that far, right? Um, it's not a great flyer. So that was really fun to do. And because kids were like, oh, I don't understand, how's it happening? It can be really fun. And I, one time on tour, I ended up taking on that role because the performer couldn't do it. And it was quite fun to perform a puppet with all these different tricks and intricacies to it. Or um, if you do like the more Henson style puppets or the, you know, some of the Henson's, Jim Henson, Sesame Street style puppets, often your hand is in doing the mouth and then you, you'll either have a rod for the second hand, but the Sesame Street ones often are like a, a practical hand, it's called. So you're like inside a glove of a hand. Um, and those can be really fun because the intricacy is all in the mouth movement. And they're really useful for things like TV and talking, right? But our, our bird didn't need to talk. It was a realistic bird. So I don't care about the mouth being able to move. So I guess I would say it totally depends on the story and what that puppet needs to be able to do to make it believable. The one area where I can get slightly just kind of ticked off, it's a taste thing, is when the puppet is so mechanized and so symmetrical that there, it's like slightly less believable for me. I know when I build puppets, I like for them to be a little bit asymmetrical. Like if I make a, I'm 
paper mache puppet face. I don't want the eyes perfect and the face perfect and because it's just, they become kind of Glinda the Good Witch and they're just everything. It doesn't feel real to me. That's taste for me. Some people really want a perfectly smooth puppet. A lot of people actually. Um, and would think it was maybe an error to have slight asymmetricality, but I, I prefer it. So when something's super mechanized, sometimes it lacks a little bit of humanity and I wish there were more room for like human error or breathing. When a hand is touching a puppet, then your breath is transmitting to that puppet. And the more you pull the puppeteer away from the puppet, the more I can get a little bummed out by like, eh, it's just sort of pulling levers and it lacks a little bit of that believability for me. But that's, that's taste. I think many people would disagree with me. Oh, it's perfect and you get it exactly the same every time. Um, I know like marionettists tend to really want absolute precision. Every time I lift this string this much, like intricate marionettists who are doing, you know, 78 string marionettes want it to be exactly the same every time often. I like a little more um, opportunity for the puppeteer to, to find, uh, find something unexpected in the puppet. Nice, thank you. It's a really good question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry they closed. That's too bad. That's like yeah. When even uh, this needs sad. to close, I'm like, what? Yeah, <laughs> very sad. I'm very disappointed, but yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It just means there's over 150 puppets sitting in a theater. So sad right now with Not no play anything. for eight months. <laughs> but you know what? That kind of thing will come back. It, it's just yeah, hopefully. Thank you for going into the, all of those puppet details. It's so fascinating to hear. I feel like that's an aspect of performance we don't always get to experience so deeply. So it's really cool to hear um, all of that. Uh, and I'm always amazed by um, like how puppeteers can just physically make that happen. <laughs> um, it's fun. When I first had my daughter and I was like trying to figure out how to function and hold a baby all the time, I was like, how do non-puppeteers do this? Because <laughs> I'm used to like, using my foot to do this and my hand, you know, I was, yeah, multitasking is a puppeteer skill I did. Oh, that's great. I'm a little, a little jealous of that previous experience now that you put that in that context. <laughs> <laughs> um, Heather, do you have a question you'd like to ask? You asked a question about um, raising hand. Yeah, I didn't even, oh, now I see the participant uh, button down there. I couldn't oh, see it. Um, that's okay. <laughs> I have a variety of questions, um, but maybe I'll throw two out. Um, one is about, uh, do your companies use like sustaining members? Um, you know, kind of like how the Vortex, I guess, sells memberships or whatever. Do you do any of that? And then also I'm very curious about the school that you went to in France and if you could just maybe talk briefly about that experience. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> that would be great. Great, yeah. So um, sustaining members is a really good system, I think, for especially for somebody like the Vortex, like the, a theater like the Vortex, where they are a venue and they are, they can pretty much promise you until recently that every weekend they'll have something for you to participate in. Um, we have, found we we did it a little bit earlier on when we were housed at salvage vanguard theater on Mainer road before that theater space disappeared like so many in town um but it didn't really fit our model exactly because we were not a company putting up like a, a predictable number of shows every year we are making new work so something might get delayed or or not be put on till a certain time of year because it's the appropriate you know we're doing something dark so we want it around halloween we're not able to kind of promise a consistent schedule the way that we we briefly went through a phase of being able to do that in austin when we knew we could reliably have two shows a year at salvage vanguard and we were mostly doing work for adults and we had kind of a a, a an audience that was consistent to that space and the, and those shows. Once we started including more kid work and doing a lot of collaborations with other theaters, it got a little trickier because for example, we got asked to make some stuff in collaboration with Zach Theater. So we've made maybe three shows for their youth 
uh, theater department, but we don't have any control over their box office. So we're kind of making the work, but they're running the show. We did something at the Vortex where they run the box office. So we, it got a little, we were kind of moving around and getting all over the place and it didn't feel reasonable to have that kind of sustained membership structure. We do have um, re uh, sort of returning uh, donors that we reach out to twice a year. I don't like to ask more than twice a year, um, but usually around, there's a thing called Amplify Austin in February that we do. And then oftentimes there'll be one other at like a, a slightly less predictable time of year, depending on what the, the, the reason is um, geared toward maybe a more specific project. Um, so we do have re returning uh, participants in that way uh, and supporters. And then we do grants, a lot of grants. And um, then we are contractors for the city. We also um, are a vendor for um, AISD and we do work for AISD. And then we have at times been, been under an agent called Holden Arts and Associate here who, who um, gets our shows sent out on national tours. Um, so we, we're just working in a lot of different kinds of venues and for different audiences right now. And it didn't make sense to have one consistent group. That's my probably overly long answer for that. I think it's great for certain theater, theater types, but it hasn't worked as well for us. Um, look, okay, so the school I went to in France is called Le Coq, L-E-C-O-Q. Um, and it is named after, that's a common French last name. It's named after Etienne Lecoq, who created the school in about the 1950s, I think. And it is an international school. It regularly um, brings in people from all over the world. There's usually about 30 to, 30 to 40 countries represented in the students each year. They take 100, or they did when I went in 2004 to 2006. I'm not kind of sure what their numbers are now, but they um, take about 100 students from all over the world each year um, and split them into three classes of 33. And then at the end of the year, they ask 33 people only total to stay and do the second year. So it's kind of like uh, a little bit like reality TV in a way where they're like, thank you, but leave. You are off the island and you guys get to stay <laughs> and do more. Um, and it really does quite feel like that. I have to say this was, I think only the real world was on at the time. It was pre-reality TV, but um, the, at the end of the year, they make you walk up a little staircase where they're all sitting in an office. And then you walk in and they say, we oui or no. <laughs> and they're like, yes or no, you're in or you're not. And then you have to walk back down the stairs and the whole school is waiting to see if you're in or not. It was horrifying. But I did get into the second year. Um, and so the school focuses on, um, uh, especially in the first year, nonverbal, very physicalized work. Um, you do a lot of just physical training, like acrobatics and stuff like that, but also um, learning how to um, show character and also to create like staging through physicality. You do start to speak eventually, but one of the reasons I do this is I didn't even really speak French when I initially went. So they, they teach in French, but you just kind of figure it out from what's going on and learn it eventually because you're living there. Um, and um, then in the second year, they go into sort of these bigger forms. This is also changing because Lecoq passed away in 1999. So there have been adjustments in the school just for modernization. Um, but it works on things like clown, like theatrical clown structures, um, white pantomime, which is a little bit like mime, but it's not just annoying people on the street by copying them. It's, uh, it's learning how to articulate and um, create physical structures where you can tell a story without relying on language as much. Um, something called grotesque, where you really work at kind of looking at the darker side of human nature and how you can build like a character that comes out of that. So a lot of the, you know, every year, I think there were th three-ish Americans when I went. So every year, a few, a few more Americans come back. Um, and a lot of the Americans that, that went there um, maybe first learned about it from a few different schools that have taught it here. Historically, I think Swarthmore does some stuff. There's a bit of a focus in Pennsylvania and a few different schools had kind of piqued people's interest in it. Um, the... I totally forgot where I was going with this. Right, that American companies that where people 
come out of it often do very physicalized character work. That is this sort of version that has been popularized in America. I was really attracted to what I would say is more the Latin American version of, of Lecoq and what the like Latin American takeaway from it has been, um, which is more working with like nonverbal texts um, and kind of creating very uh, work that can be seen and understood whether the characters are speaking or not. Um, so visually driven storytelling. Um, and I'm generalizing here when I say Americans do this, Latin Americans do that, but that has been like a tendency um, if you look at the companies that have come out of it. So I wouldn't say that everybody that did Lecoq in America is making what I would make. Um, and that is the intention of the school itself. Lecoq was really interested in, he said his goal for the uh, pedagogy structure was not that he taught you how to do all these moves and then you memorize them and then all the students left the school looking exactly like what he did. He wanted to create a series of obstacles that you as a performer, director, designer go through. And in, in fighting those obstacles, you discover on the other end of it what your, what your version of theater is. And it's what I love so much about the pedagogy. I think it's a really smart approach. It's not about creating clones. It's about creating, um, just letting you find out what, your, what is most true to you. For example, the clown technique that he teaches is not about like, here's what clowns do, run around and do what clowns do. It's definitely about figuring out what is severely awkward about you that you try to hide from the world and put that on display. Um, and be, be uncomfortable and simultaneously comfortable with that and then push it as far as you can. That's, that's his approach to clown in it. Um, whether you ever wanna be a theatrical clown or not, it's a really good experience to go through to learn how to, how to roll with the punches and, and accept that who you are is individually interesting and special and we shouldn't be hiding it and neutralizing it. We should be sharing it. Cool, thank you for filling us in. That was awesome. Thanks. Is that how you ended up in the Dominican? You went to the Dominican Republic? Is that what that I- That was for puppetry. So I used to be a Spanish teacher. That's how I managed to um, kind of be a theater maker in the evenings <laughs> for a long time. Um, and so I, I spoke Spanish and I've done a lot of uh, teaching both Spanish and English as a second language. Um, and because I'm a theater person, I did a lot of conversational and like uh, experiential driven teaching. Um, and I got connected to a woman who was want, running a project for teenagers in the Dominican Republic because she'd spent some time in that town. Um, and they, and she asked them, what would you want? Like, if I could bring people in from America to teach you things, what do you want to learn? And they, she thought it would be, you know, technology. And they were like, art, <laughs> we want to figure out how to, how, you know, how to do this. So I wrote to her um, based on a friend who connected us and said, I, this is what I would teach. Um, so I taught tabletop puppetry there, which is puppetry uh, where three different people are manipulating the same puppet. I really love it as a, a exercise for high school students because you learn how to work as a unit um, to do it because you're essentially becoming one character, three people working together to become one character in very close proximity. Um, so I was there for a, a month or something like that and and teaching them and then i got to learn a bunch of um dominican dance styles as kind of an exchange and uh it was it's a really cool program sweet thanks i, I saw one i know you're all, you're basically out of time i just saw a chat question though yeah if you want to take that away for our last question because we are we're very close um amelia says i um i know it's a big problem getting is getting discouraged in show business, how do you deal with negativity or how would you prefer dealing with negativity? So that sounds um, like a great question to send us off. That's the end, right? Okay. <laughs> I think that the downfall of show business is acting like it's a competition. It is to some degree a competition, but if you treat competitive people like you're they're your collaborators it's almost like you neutralize them I think I find um so trying to neutralize that competitive aspect and seeing that everybody has something to bring and to gain and also accepting when you know you like when somebody else would be the better person to be in charge in this moment and when it actually should be you and you should speak up so um 
there are people who are so negative, you just need to cut them out. And I think that's really important to know and acknowledge. But I, I would say the first step is to, um, to, to treat it like you're a collaborator and that the hierarchy is leveled. I know that's my approach. I feel the most negative when I'm in a space and I get, you are either told or looked at like, you have no business saying that the equity rules do not allow you to touch that thing or whatever. And I think um, responding back to that with positivity is often like a surprise <laughs> to people. Um, and I also think it's the wave of the future. I think some, especially older folks in the field are frustrated and um, feeling jaded. And I, I think we have an opportunity to, to shift that uh, attitude with with positivity or just neutral like okay cool you be you I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to be positive thank you I think that that's really a fantastic uh, way to end and an ethos for all of us to take forward in our artistic practice let's bring positivity um, as we go out so thank you so much for joining us today Caroline we really appreciate of your course, feel, feel free to email me. You can find the email on the website, but it's caroline at glass half full theater, theater with an re.com. Pretty easy to find if you look it up on the internet. If any other questions or thoughts or, you know, I'm happy to talk. Thank you. I appreciate best that a lot. Luck. Yeah, best of luck, everybody, with your careers and projects. <laughs>